Hi, and welcome to my talk about implementing a programming language with Name. My name is Fabio, and I've been working for Siemens for quite some time, first as a tech writer, then as a software architect, and then uh, I'm currently uh, working at ABB as a software developer and architect. Um, in my free time, I like programming and programming languages, in particular programming in NIM uh, that I've been using uh, for open source projects since 2014. And I actually tried it out since it came out in 2008 as, as Nimrod. I'm very fond of Star Trek and science fiction, and I'm a fan of open source. For more information about myself and my work, uh, check out chevasco.org and herald.com. But let's get started, shall we? So I wanted to build a programming language. Um, that's something that uh, a lot of programmers go through uh, at some point in their life. They, they want to create a, a new programming language that has something that is missing from other languages. And so a lot of people end up creating uh, new uh, Lisps or more C-like languages. And, uh, well, I wanted to do something a little bit different. I wanted to do something that was uh, a bit weird, a bit unusual, uh, that was minimalist, but also at the same time, that was also practical enough to do something, to use it in the real world for real world tasks, even small tasks. But I wanted something I could use every day to do some uh, uh, automation jobs and so on and so forth. Um, so it had to have a, a rich standard library, with things like HTTP request and support for regular expressions and so on. And also I wanted it to come with a shell, with a redevelopment loop with auto-completion. So I started off by looking at the Make-A-List project, which is great if you didn't check it out. And I did actually end up building a small Lisp implementation in NIM. Um, but th there was already uh, an implementation uh, for that project. So I thought, well, let's stop here and let's, uh, let's start again and let's use this knowledge to build something else. Uh, and that's how Min was born. And you can see, you can have more information at, at minlang.org. The site has been up for quite some time. So what does Min look like? It Basically, it's a functional and concatenative programming language. So it's something that is very similar to languages like Fortran uh, or Factor or Joy, if you ever heard of it. Mm, not a very popular paradigm, arguably kind of difficult to read. And so that was also a challenge during the, the implementation. And I did... Uh, add a few things to improve the readability of the language, like sigils that I'm using for syntactic sugars to, to, to access environment variables or to, to, to bind data to, to symbols and so on. Uh, so MIN comes with many different data types and also some complex data types like dictionaries and quotations, which are basically lists. Uh, it comes with a lightweight module system with uh, quite a few symbols to do anything from HTTP request to regular expression, string manipulation, uh, maths, and so on. Um, and it's self-contained. So you basically end up with a statically compiled single file that you can use as is to interpret main programs. So for more information about min and all the links like the repo and download and so on, head over to minlang.org. Well, if you're curious about the concatenative programming paradigm, head over to concatenative.org. That's a wiki on, on all languages that are concatenative. So uh, yeah, okay, that was an example. I didn't really quite go through it. And yeah, maybe it's not the most intuitive things in the world. So maybe it's better if we go through it step by step. So first of all, uh, let, let's, let's have a look. So um, the first step, we are basically pushing a string, literal, on the stack, corresponding to the URL of uh, a, a public API that we'll be using to check the exchange rates to get uh, uh, the, the value of how much uh, a, a euro is worth in, in US dollars. So 
the string literal gets pushed on the stack, and so the stack has one element, that string. Fair enough. Easy, right? Then the get content symbol is pushed on the stack. So this symbol basically takes a string from the stack uh, that represents an HTTP URL, and it executes a get request uh, and fetches the, the, the body of the response and, and, and pushes it on the stack as a string. So basically, this is synchronous, uh, we get a, a big string uh, containing the, the result of the API call, which is a basically in JSON format, but it's a string anyway. And so it, it, it needs to get processed properly before we can actually access uh, that value that represents the, the exchange rate for a euro to a US dollar. So then we push the from JSON symbol on the stack. So this symbol, as you can imagine, it treats uh, a, a string uh, as a as JSON, and it pushes the result uh, as a deserialized min value on the stack. So uh, min is fully interoperable with JSON. So in the end, we get a dictionary with all the exchange rates. And uh, yeah, you notice that the syntax is is in postfix notation as well, like everything else in in, in min. But you can kind of guess that is uh, a dictionary, really, a, an object containing different exchange rates. So then, uh, and this is the bit where I was talking about readability earlier, we're going to save this value onto a variable, onto a symbol. And for doing this, we're using the column sigil and the string data. So this is basically a shorthand for data defined symbol which defines a symbol called data containing the, the value, the last value pushed on the stack. Uh, so now we have essentially a big dictionary stored in a variable called data on the uh, local scope. Then we carry on and here we use another sigil. So this asterisk sigil is a shorthand for the invoke symbol, which takes a string formatted as a path that can be used to navigate through a dictionary, through a, an object. So here we are going through the uh, data symbol, and then inside it, we're going for the rates key, and then finally the USD key. And that basically returns the value of that key, which is 1.218518 at the time of writing, which is uh, the amount of uh, how much a euro is worth in US dollars. Then we push two on the stack. Why? Because we want to round this value to two decimal values. So first we put we push two on the stack, and then we call we, we push the round symbol on the stack, which takes um, two values, uh, an integer corresponding to the number of digits and a numeric value, a floating point value, and it rounds it up to the specified number of digits. So now we get 1.22, which is pushed on the stack. And then we are going to save this as well to uh, the USD symbol using the same column sigil like we did earlier for the uh, data symbol. So now we have data, which contains the, uh, the big dictionary that we already use, and the USD uh, symbol that contains the value which we want to print, essentially. Uh, the, the amount of uh, how much a, uh, a euro is worth in US dollars. So then we push a string, and this string, if you know Nim, you'll remember that uh, uh, the dollar hash symbol there is basically a placeholder which is used for string interpolation. And that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to do string interpolation using uh, min. So first we push a string on the stack, which has a placeholder. And then we push a quotation, so a sort of a list containing one symbol, USD, which doesn't get evaluated for now. That's, that's why it's quoted, so to speak. Um, and that's it. So that gets pushed on the stack. Then we push the equal percent symbol, uh, which is then evaluated. And it's basically an idiomatic alias for apply interpolate. So what does this do? Basically, 
is like calling two symbols. First, uh, it calls apply, which takes it a quotation of symbols and returns a quotation containing the same number of elements, but corresponding to the symbol values. Uh, so in this case, we will get a quotation containing 1.22, and then interpolate, which takes a quotation of literal values and a string, and it performs an interpolation, exactly like NIMS percent operator. So the result is pushed on the stack. So one euro is worth 1.22 US dollars. Uh, done? Not quite, because we push the value on the stack, but we didn't print it. So to print it, we simply call put, followed by an exclamation mark. So the, the, the put symbol, it simply prints a value without removing it from the stack. But then we want to tidy things up and we, 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 we follow it with the exclamation mark suffix, which causes the value to be popped out from the stack. This is called auto popping in MIM. And so, yeah, um, actually, the example that we, we, we showed is not probably the most idiomatic when it comes to concatenated programming. So, if you read articles about Joy, you will say that, uh, uh, you know, you, you don't have to use variables because you can simply manipulate the stack. You can stack. Uh, values after value and then shuffle the stack and then whenever you're, you're ready you push stuff out and uh, you put you pop stuff out and, and you print it and this is the same example without using intermediate variables and you can kind of understand what's going on there but if you notice there are already some some stack shuffles like the cons or the swap uh, symbols that are used so it, it immediately loses in, in terms of, of readability. So this is the compromise that I came to when I implemented NIM. I wanted it to be concatenative because it's fun at times, but also I have a way out to, to make it more readable. So essentially to sum up, how does this language work? So we read the input and then are we at the end of the input? Uh, no, okay, so we parse the token. So is the token valid? Yeah, okay, so we interpret at the value. And then if is it a symbol? Uh, if it's not a symbol, then we push it on the stack. If it is a symbol, then we gotta check if it exists. And then if it exists, uh, we evaluate the symbol. Uh, otherwise, if it doesn't exist, then we check if the the, the symbol is, contains a sigil at the start, and then if it does, we evaluate the sigil, and then we push the result on the stack, and then we repeat. And then in case of fatal errors that are not caught during the, um, uh, the, the execution flow, because MIN also offers ways to, to, to perform error handling, uh, errors are thrown and, and the, the, the program terminates. So uh, I guess we can do a quick demo. So as you can see here, I have my example. I can type in min example.min, and then we get the uh, value. If you don't trust me, then we can try with pound. I'm not gonna bother changing the string, but just, uh, uh, oh, well, okay. GB, GBP, I'm going to change everything, GBP, and then GBP, and then save, and then execute, and there you go, uh, euro is worth 0 0.86 pounds, so this shows you that uh, the program actually works. Uh, yeah, okay, yeah, that, that took a while, didn't it? So I didn't actually show you any NIM code and I've been rambling around MIN all the time. So yeah, maybe it's time that I actually start showing some NIM code. Let's see how, how this works in, internally. So we start off with the MIN interpreter object. So this object is the core of the language, is uh, instantiated a startup, and every time we need to evaluate something like a, a, um, uh, uh, an external file or, or uh, in, you know, it's, if, uh, 
it's used by a special symbol uh, for for evaluation and so on. Uh, it contains uh, reference to the parser, to the scope that contains reference to the uh, symbols and sigils uh, defined locally. Uh, it has a reference to the main stack and to the stack trace using for used for uh, diagnostic purposes uh, and a bunch of other stuff. So then we have the mean parser object. Now, he, this is a funny story here. When I started uh, creating mean in 2014, uh, I was kind of scared of creating a parser from, from scratch. I don't know why. I, I was young back then. And, and so I thought, well, let's, let's start with something that is already there. Also because I didn't know mean that much, really. A uh, name, sorry. And so... I took the JSON parser of uh, NIM version 0 0.9.6 and I basically modified it to include support for more mean specific syntax such as quotations and dictionary, but uh, things like uh, numbers and strings and, and booleans are basically the same as uh, they are parsed in the JSON parser of NIM. So that was a, a, a way to kickstart the parser and uh, it, it gave me a chance to learn more about about this. And now, well, now some parts are still very similar to the JSON parser, but a lot of stuff is actually uh, mean specific. Then uh, we have the mean value object. So this uh, object type is instantiated every time we need to wrap a mean value, uh, be it an int, a float, or even you know a dictionary, a, quotation and so on. So it's used to store a value essentially and an optional documentation comment that is used only for symbols. And note that I actually have a raw pointer there in dictionary type. Why? Because that's used whenever we need to do something weird in mean and point to some low level stuff like a socket. Um, so that's that's the way to store, let's say, foreign objects inside language. Then we have the min operator. So this basically represents the implementation of a symbol. So uh, operators can either be uh, name prox, so just basic simple prox that take the interpreter as a parameter, um, or uh, um, a mean quotation uh, that can then be uh, evaluated by the interpreter itself. And here we have the main parsing and implementation interpretation loop. So this uh, proc is called uh, to uh, kickstart the interpreter. And as you can see, there is a loop there that parses, that calls the parse mean value uh, proc of the parser and it calls the push proc as well to push the resulting value on the stack. And also there's also some uh, a template for doing error handling that is quite useful as well. So note that actually min is kind of unique in the sense that uh, is interpreted, parsed and interpreted uh, one symbol, one value at a time. This actually works because min does not have any language construct like that. It, it, it's kind of similar to Lisp in a way. So everything is a value. So I can keep parsing value by value and everything works. Uh, so how do we parse min values? Now, we saw earlier that we have the parse min value proc. Uh, this um, proc is, is used to uh, check for specific tokens when they are encountered by the parser and then create, uh, instantiate new min values. Note that they are going to create new min values for now, for true, false, string, and so on and so forth. In case of complex values like um, dictionaries and quotations, like in case a, a, a left bracket or, or brace is found, there is actually a secondary uh, parsing loop that starts and is used to parse the content of that dictionary or or, or quotation. And that's that that's carried on recursively. So 
uh, it will be able to parse dictionaries of dic containing dictionaries and quotations containing quotations and so on and so forth. Um, so at this point, if there is anything wrong uh, as far as the parser goes, it will be found and an error will be raised at this stage. Uh, we talked about tokens. So uh, every time after parsing uh, a value, the, the parser is instructed to, to parse the next token and he will use internally the get token method to set the current token. Um, so basically here we are just looking at for certain specific characters like uh, brackets and braces and, and the digits and uh, the minus sign and dots and uh, some constants like true and false. This part is actually very similar to the JSON name parser. But of course, it supports some main specific syntax for quotations and dictionaries. Then uh, we also saw that push proc was used. So this proc it basically pushes a value, a min value on the stack. So literals are just pushed as is on the stacks while symbols are evaluated, if they're recognized. So if a symbol is recognized, fine, the corresponding implementation, the corresponding operator is called. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna try to check for sigils at the start uh, of a symbol. Uh, and then if a sigil is found, there is an, uh, the, the corresponding sigil operator is called. And then at the end, if the, after the evaluation, we check for the presence of a question mark to do auto popping. So uh, to, to basically automatically pop a value off the stack. Uh, this is actually incredibly handy. Uh, the more you, you program in Min, the more you, you realize it. And uh, yeah, let's, let's see about, let's talk about lexical scoping a little bit. So Min uh, actually supports lexical scoping. So a scope in min is basically a dictionary that contains references to the uh, local symbols and sigils and a reference to a parent script. Uh, so we can create a scope chain in this way. And uh, the, the root scope is the top level scope that typically contains all the symbols that have been imported through the min prelude. We'll, we'll be getting to that in a minute. Um, and uh, so we'll see soon that the mean scope can be defined natively through NIM code or at the language level in, with mean using uh, a special symbol. They use quotation to identify code blocks. So you actually have code blocks in, in this language. Just uh, They are just treated as, as, a, as a list, as a race. Um, if a symbol isn't found in the current scope, then the parent, the parent scope is checked and so on and so forth. Uh, if we reach the root scope, as you can see, and we didn't find a symbol, we raise an error, and that's that. Simple enough. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, so that's enough for the internal. So let's see how do we get to make something useful with the language, right? How do we use NIM to implement something useful in MIM? Okay, so let's talk about modules. So uh, modules are dictionaries. So mm, yeah, uh, they can be implemented in, in min or nim. And um, uh, they can be loaded and they can be imported. Uh, they can be used, they can be loaded and then uh, accessed via the invoke symbol like we did briefly earlier. Or you can import all the symbol of a module in the current scope. This is what happens uh, actually in the so-called min prelude, uh, which is a file that automatically imports all the symbols of all modules that are comprised in the standard library. So string, logic, num, stack, sequence, and so on and so forth. Um, then, uh, so let's say you want to build, uh, you want to create a new module for uh, min using name, and maybe you want to uh, embed min in your uh, NIM program. How do you go about that? Well, there is an API and it's actually quite easy if you know NIM. Uh, so essentially there are some helper procs that you can use. Uh, you start with define, which defines uh, a new scope. And then after, after calling define, you can call uh, the symbol or the sigil proc 
to define a symbol or a sigil. Um, that is basically, uh, you, you basically define the, the, the body of a proc, nothing much more than that. You have access to the interpreter yeah. and you can do uh, pretty much uh, whatever uh, you, you want inside there, as we'll see in a minute. Then when you're done, you call the finalize uh, proc, which will create the actual module. Um, so let's see how this actually works. So this is an excerpt of uh, how uh, the sys module is implemented. So here we're defining a top-level proc just for our convenience, which can then, we can then call to uh, basically call the, the, define the, the, our module. So we start by uh, calling define, and then we, we call the symbol proc uh, to define our symbols. So here we are defining basically a symbol dot, which corresponds, evaluates to the current directory, a symbol uh, double dot, which evaluates to the parent directory, uh, and a symbol CD. Uh, here we are, we are doing something a little bit more refined because actually CD expects a, a parameter that in this case can be a, sim, a quoted symbol uh, or a string uh, that corresponds to a path. Uh, so basically then after getting that, we, we try, we join it with the current directory and then we set the current directory, exactly the, like the CD uh, command in, in Unix and Linux. Then uh, another example is the system symbol. Again, it expects a, a string-like value, so uh, a quoted symbol or a string, and basically executes it as a shell command. And returns the value as a min value. That new val uh, proc is actually very handy. It can convert basically anything from nim to min, uh, to a min value. And that's basically you use it all the time. Uh, finally, when we're done, we finalize the module and we call it sys. So uh, later when we want to uh, register this module, we just call the sys module proc and it will execute all the uh, definition to define the new module. So if you want to have a look at an example on how to embed min inside a NIM program, you can have a look at hasty site, which is my static site generator that is written in NIM and uses min internally to define all the rules and custom behaviors and tasks. Yeah, I mean, it was fun. It's not for, for everyone, of course, but I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, adding embedding main into into this program. So here, if you notice, we are defining the hasty site module using the helper proc that uh, we 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 we've seen so far. And in this case, we are exposing some hasty site specific functionality like markdown processing, for example, um, using the hasty scribe um, library, which is also another project of mine. Uh, and then uh, we can see in this interpret proc how to initialize a min interpreter. We just basically call new min interpreter, pass the file and a directory. Uh, we call the hasty site module, which is the proc which we defined above. And uh, we were good to go. We can start interpreting uh, a, a file in this case, and uh, it will take into account also the uh, hasty site module. Well, actually, technically, you have to import it or you have to invoke uh, the the corresponding symbols, but is known to 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 mean to to exist anyway. So yeah, it's actually very easy, and you don't really need to know that much. The API is fairly simple, and uh, it, it can be easily. It, it's very easy to extend the language with, with your own custom stuff. Uh, Another topic, rather big topic, is the shell. So min comes with an advanced readable print loop which leverages nimline, which is yet again another project of mine, which is a full full nim, uh, full, full uh, read line alternative written in nim. So uh, basically, uh, the min shell can, supports processing a single line of min. This is a limitation of the time and display the top value of the stack every time we each line is evaluated. So the, 
the interpreter API is used to push new values on the stack, interpret the min code, and print min values. Uh, as you can see, nothing particularly new here. Everything is fairly straightforward. Um, and then, yeah, there is that get completion proc, which is not strictly related to min, but uh, it shows you how to use the uh, nimline library to implement some uh, code completion based on uh, some starting characters like uh, dollar or exclamation mark and so on. Then, okay, this is an interesting feature. <laughs> I thought that it would be handy to be able to generate your own executable in Min. And so actually Min supports the so-called compilation. is not quite the compilation you'd expect. As you can see, the, the usual example that I've been going through uh, is converted into the Nim code on the right. So here, as you can see, it's just a sequence of uh, values being pushed on the stack. So in other words, is the interpretation of the program. You basically get you, you basically skip the parsing phase by, by doing the, the compilation. So once you have this uh, NIM file, you can basically compile it using NIM, and then in turn you can use GCC or, or LLVM or, or whatever C compiler you want to use. And at the end, you get an executable. And to be honest, NIM is doing all the hard work here. But still, it's quite cool to start from a min program and, uh, uh, and get a, a single executable. Let's now talk a little bit about diagnostic. We saw in the previous slide that the handle errors template is used to catch errors that occurs when parsing and interpreting. Now, what happens is uh, in, in, in this template, the, the, the whole stack is copied. And this is done because in case an error is handled through min code, we need to be able to restore the stack before the error occurred. At the same time, also uh, a stack trace is populated with every symbol that is pushed uh, on the stack. And every symbol contains information on the line, the column, and the file where it was used. Uh, the current symbol is also saved in a carsim variable. So when an error occurs, it's typically always possible to examine exactly what symbol was, was being pushed to the stack and get uh, a full trace to understand what's going on. So let's see how this works. So here we have the previous example. Uh, instead of USD, we are saving this to US. So this is a typical type. And now we try to run the code. And there you go. So min complains instantly and says, that the error occurred at uh, line 10 in column 32. So exactly here. So in the middle of the, at the start of the equal percent symbol. Uh, why? Because it tried to execute apply interpolate, which tried to execute apply and tried to execute USD, which is not defined because of course we made a typo here. Note that it tells you, of course, not where, where the type was, but where the actual error occurred. So the first usage of the USD symbol, which is here, uh, and within this uh, apply interpolate alias. If we change it back, and we save, and we execute, everything runs as normal. And so that's it. So let's talk about practical uses about min. I said at the beginning that I wanted to build a language that I could use to do something practical with. And that's, that's basically what happened. I use min uh, every day for writing small scripts, for uh, copying files from a source to another, and uh, as the main scripting language for HastySight. Uh, which is my static site generator that also powers minlang.org and herald.com. And I also use it as a primary backend language for uh, nifty.tools, which is a site that I launched rather um, without too much publicity, uh, but it uses uh, a completely min powered API. So I use min to basically code 
all the HTTP uh, API that powers the site for all the CRUD operations that can be performed for authenticated users and a very simple cookie-based uh, authentication system. Unfortunately, this is not open source yet, but uh, I may open source it if I get around to write some documentation and tidy up the code a little bit. And it was quite fun. And he actually proved that the language can be used to create something as complex as uh, an HTTP API. So if you'd like to know more about this, please let me know and uh, I, I may open source it soon. Um, okay, so I pretty much reached my time limit here. I think I have to wrap it up. That's fair enough. Um, okay, so it was great in the end. Let's be honest, programmers create programming language for the sake of creating programming languages, really, because it's it's fun. And implementing MIM using MIM was fun. Uh, it, it, MIM especially lowered the entry barrier that you have when, when you typically want to implement a programming language, which is typically represented by C or C++ or other uh, uh, complex, low-level languages. Um, so I learned a lot about programming in NIM. I learned a lot about compiling C code for uh, and linking it statically to uh, to a to a executable file. I'm talking about OpenSSL or per compatible uh, regular expressions that are built in in NIM. I learned about creating a parser from scratch, not really from scratch, but in the end, I learned how to create and and and, up and add features to a parser and. Above all, I implemented a programming language that can be used and that can also provide some useful uh, diagnostic messages, which is typically something that uh, people tend to left, leave out when they create their own custom languages. Uh, of course, there's room for improvement. So if you are curious about MIN and you, you, you know NIM, uh, you can uh, give it a try and try maybe develop some more modules for it. Uh, we're, I'm planning of, of creating a SQLite module and another module for XML parsing and querying, and also some benchmarks would be nice. Uh, it's not going to be blazing fast, of course, but also some performance improvements could be could be implemented. So if you're so inclined, don't hesitate to con to, to to contact me and uh, head over to the repo at github.com slash herald slash min. And you can find everything at min-lang.org. And that's it. I hope you really enjoyed my presentation and keep coding in min above all. Thank you very much. Bye.